Thank you, Lynn. All right, everyone, thank you for your patience right there. I did actually rehearse that, so I knew it would take a little bit of time. So um, anyways, first, uh, I'd like to say thank you to the family for uh, hosting this. I think it's a really exciting event. Um, I think uh, actually Dub Smash, um, in general as a company, doesn't really get out there that much. Uh, and it's actually surprising that people know that uh, Dub Smash is in Berlin, and so I think uh, you know, we want to be more present in the community and I think sharing a little bit of our insights where we've done well, where we've uh, didn't do as well, um, I think could be some really great knowledge and help you all when you're building your startups or if you're thinking about um, doing a startup here in Berlin. So, so uh, my goal here is actually very, very small. Like I, I, I want to do something a little bit different from the typical kind of like this is how you do agile product management talk. Uh, I wanted to do something a little bit more experimental. I'm kind of a weird dude. So uh, so my, my goal is very, very low. Inspire one person to think about consumer internet differently. So only if one person is inspired, so please somebody fake it, raise your hand later on when I ask the question, tell me that you're, you've been inspired and then I will come from this talk satisfied. So um, yeah, so... Uh, what is Dub Smash? So I think a lot of you, there's a lot of you who kind of raise your hand and then it was uh, kind of uh, amusing to me then when you say, do you still use it? And you uh, bring your hand down. And trust me, it, it, it hurts, but I also know very well. Um, so Dub Smash um, kind of came in the scene back in 2015. It was a lip syncing video selfie app. The, the, the phrase is say it with video. And basically what it does is you take a sound snippet uh, and what you do is you apply it to a video and then you've had this kind of unique creation that you could share to the world. And so when it was launched back in 2000, uh, late 2014, um, since then it's actually uh, gone over 175 million downloads over the past two years. Uh, it's actually super, I, I guess I need to point it directly out here to do it. Um, over the last two years, uh, we've created three billion um, independent videos that people have shared externally on their platforms. And then it's all been done uh, with zero marketing. So I think the only marketing that the founders ever did was basically spend about 200 euros on beer at an HPI recruiting event. So that is the only marketing spend that they have ever done. Um, but basically, I want to kind of give you, first of all, a quick overview on kind of like what Dub Smash is. It's kind of like why I'm here and why you're here to listen. And uh, then afterwards, I'm actually purposely putting my introduction on who I am uh, in the middle of the presentation because I think it is a nice segue. So basically, what, why did Dub Smash work? And the reason why Dub Smash worked is because it was a simple product, but it was also an incomplete product. And the reason why that I, I kind of emphasize incomplete product is this incompleteness, which is actually what helped create this kind of viral loop. So basically what happens is this is actually screenshots. I'm going to move this over here. Uh, these are actually screenshots of the very, very first app, right? So basically you had your, your sound snip. You can pick something in here. You can see this is even a screenshot with all their test sounds. So you pick a sound. You basically record a video. You have the sound wave on top of it. So you're able to kind of record a video, and then eventually you're able to share it on external platforms. The, the, the platform, the entire app was built in an afternoon by one guy. Um, and so basically they, they did this, they uh, uh, launched it in the first week, they had 30,000 users, and then in the first month you had a million users, and then eventually that kind of cascaded to the peak period in April when uh, Neymar posted a video, they got 12 million downloads uh, within the month of April, 2 million in one day. And all of that is because of this kind of external sharing. And the secret kind of to the external sharing is basically making sure that you brand your video with a watermark. And this was kind of like a, a very quick hack that they did. You render the video, you put it out there, and uh, basically um, it generates impressions upon impressions and then uh, kind of comes back into um, installations in the app. So what's interesting is, again, I want to emphasize that it is the watermark. Uh, the watermark has been kind of the secret weapon of Dub Smash, and it's actually very interesting to see that even to this day, it's a huge driver of installations. Uh, so this is basically, you know, viral virality at its kind of finest. And if you think about it, um, if there's different types of virality, uh, Josh Elman from Greylock does a great post. Uh, it's called uh, Imitation Virality. I could shoot the link around. It's it's pretty fantastic, but this is actually what it is. It's people seeing it, you know, on their network and then installing the application. And if you look at kind of our numbers, basically we have about 90% of our installs 
are all from either uh, from search, whether it's an App Store search or kind of a Google search. So, so even today, uh, we have a lot of competitors right now. A lot of people like sister products, like adjacent products, are also kind of following the strategy. It kind of makes me wish that people like at our company uh, patented it or was able to do something with it, but. But it seems to be kind of a very standard uh, strategy now to, um, to help grow kind of a creation utility platform, uh, whereas beforehand uh, that didn't exist. And so even today, two years after the fact, what we do is we still have on average about 100,000 downloads per day. And so this is the actually, uh, actual numbers of average installs for the last three months. And that's all because of that watermark, and that's all because of the strategy of getting external content on the platform. So in spite of our efforts to uh, put a whole uh, to put a block on that and to make sure that we build a strong ecosystem on the application uh, and we put a lot of different uh, barriers for the user to do that they still find a way to get it out there and so that's actually something we can talk a little bit later on is that we want to embrace so who actually am I and I, I didn't even talk about the the title of the talk so the title of the talk was um, human needs in a post physical area or uh, you know why pretending to be Taylor Swift is the real me and so uh, what I want to go and talk about is like really, I was hired basically about a year and a half ago. So like this entire dub smash story that I'm telling you right now, I wasn't there for it. Uh, it happened in the early 2015 and I joined in mid 2015. So I came in kind of already, <laughs> systems were burning, you know, people were just kind of like meeting in closets trying to figure out like what's going on. And already kind of the founders had this decision that they wanted to take the platform and turn it into kind of a communication platform. They thought that that's the behavior that they saw people using, taking their dubs, sharing it on messaging, sharing it on WhatsApp. And so they were like, well, we should build this on our own platform. And so, so I kind of got that mission. I was like, this is what I want to execute on. But what really I was hired for is as the first product manager, really to kind of think critically about it. Are we doing the right thing? You know, I need to be kind of a, a culture. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, uh, she's a great equalizer here. Um, a cultural anthropologist to try and figure out like why did Dub Smash work? You know why doesn't it work right now? And what we can do to actually uh, revive it? And so, so uh, yeah. So who am I? Um, so basically, I have a pretty weird story. Uh, so this is me back in the day, a long time ago. Uh, I did my first job out of high school. I was an Army Ranger uh, in the, for the United States Army. So I was a special operations medic. I did a lot of deployments overseas. Um, and uh, after uh, four and a half years of service, I actually went to college in New York. Uh, after my college experience, um, I sold out. I became a consultant. Uh, so I was a consultant at McKinsey. Uh, this was my first project uh, uh, working at a bank. Uh, you can see the joy in my face here. Um, but, but I cannot dismiss the experience. It was a fantastic experience. It really rewired my brain to uh, tackle like problems analytically. So I really appreciate the experience and it's something that I think a lot of ex-consultants do um, enjoy as well. And finally, afterwards, I did a couple of my own startups, started an ad tech company and dev shop. And then finally, you know, after about uh, two years uh, post McKinsey, I found myself doing a freelance iOS project in Berlin, seeing Dub Smash wanting to stay here, so I showed up on the doorstep and I said, I'm your guy. And so they hired me and uh, it's been a uh, uh, match made in heaven ever since. Uh, so uh, I started off as a, their first product manager back in 2015 and then um, in 2016, uh, well, end of 2016, uh, I was promoted to uh, the chief product officer uh, and I'm charged with uh, being a cultural anthropologist and, and redefining uh, what Dub Smash means to the rest of the world. All right, so I think Berlin has a problem. Um, and uh, basically, since coming here, I've noticed that many people in Berlin actually don't know what to make of Dub Smash. Uh, Dub Smash just kind of feels like an alien company here, more akin to being um, uh, a, a company more comfortable in San Francisco than in Berlin. Uh, when I go out and I've done a couple of these talks, um, I get these kind of questions that, how do you make money? What problem are you solving? What's your business model? And can you send us a five-year pro forma? And so it's interesting because uh, a lot of the capital that we raise outside of the initial kind of seed and uh, the angel and seed round has all been external. It's all been from the US or all from kind of like pan-European funds that we believe uh, understand more of consumer internet. And it's interesting because um, this kind of pervasive thought of that Dub Smash is in a real business has been super um, 
interesting for me that people don't understand. Berlin really doesn't understand consumer internet very well. Um, and I think obviously we say, okay, the DNA is e-commerce, you have Rocket, you have like this kind of like second wave of Rocket entrepreneurs coming in there. Um, I, think it's, I think it's something that we do need to kind of educate, you know, the, uh, the ecosystem about and like what consumer internet startups are because consumer internet startups actually generate quite a bit of value uh, um, in proportion to um, their actual kind of like share of the labor force. And so we have quite a few amazing consumer internet startups uh, here in Berlin as well. So it's not for a lack of people trying to do consumer internet startups, but it is something that's actually pretty hard to do here. Uh, we even have like a, like a video ad like delivery platform, like with Fiber, they have a, a cool uh, supply side platform here as well. And so there's, there should be like uh, this kind of like knowledge, but it, but it isn't something that is kind of like uh, widespread. Uh, so consumer internet startups are actually just 5% of Berlin startups right now. So how do you make money? To me, when I hear this, I get super angry. I'm like, come on, man, that's a super easy question, how you do it. How does Facebook, how does Google, how do any consumer internet startup make money? It's actually very simple. You, mon you monetize traffic like everyone else. Monetization um, is naturally for us not the focus, right? You know, you want to make sure you have enough traffic to, to be able to perpetuate monetization. But let me just walk you through some hypothetical numbers, right? So, so basically last year we created 1.5 billion videos on the platform. This is no joke. So uh, when we talk about YouTube here, uh, kind of at, at our uh, um, apotheosis, we actually were uh, getting about 35 videos a second. Um, so if you actually multiply that, the average views that we had on the platform was about 30. This is not even including um, external views, but views on the platform is about 30 views. And if you basically go on an average, let's say $10 uh, CPM, uh, and you put a, vi uh, a video ad every 10 uh, video views, uh, then you eventually would get 45 million. Kind of very, very conservative number, but at least just the traffic that we generated last year. If we had an ad ads in there, if we had a sales team, Trust me, this isn't scientific. This is totally back of napkin. But, but this just shows you that traffic, obviously, is the game of consumer nets. You, you generate traffic, you monetize it. So it's something that like, I do hope to educate people over time that Dub Smash is a business. Uh, it's something that uh, a lot of people naturally have a knee-jerk reaction to. I was actually at N26 giving a talk, and that was like the question consistently getting in there was like, how do you make a business? And I'm like, man, this is such an easier monetization model than, than thinking about even banking. Uh, especially with the interest rate right now, if people are following that. So, so, but this question right here, what problem are you solving? This is a much harder one. This is one where a lot of people bullshit. You know, what problem is Dub Smash currently solving? Lip syncing video selfie app. Hey, um, you know, like I had this urge, you know, to, to sing out Taylor Swift, I monetize that. Um, it doesn't really resonate with, uh, with uh, people, especially investors in Berlin. Um, and so this is me kind of there. I'm like, I, you know, like, I don't know how to answer this question. Um, and so that was actually one of the big problems here is what people tested me on is like, what problem are we actually solving with Dub Smash? And for me, uh, I'm, a, I'm a history major. I'm not an engineer um, uh, naturally. I've taught myself iOS. I'm very poor at it. Uh, you do not want me building your apps. Uh, but it's something that like, uh, I've always really loved history and I've always loved philosophy. And so I think that it's actually very applicable, like these soft kind of skills that are perceivedly soft are actually super relevant if you want to try and understand your business. So in the end, in order to s say what problem you're solving, you have to understand the problem that exists out there. And so for me, again, now back to the title of the thing, uh, my thesis is that human needs are more than physical. And so basically, what do we mean by more than physical and these physical needs? And it's kind of something that is super ingrained. It's Psych 101, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's a very material view of looking at the world. I'm a person, I need to be safe from, from you know, jungle cats, I need to have clothes, I need to have fire, I need to eat food, and then I can start thinking about, you know, lip syncing video selfie apps. Okay, great, totally understand that. Um, but this kind of, um, it's so pervasive, like people still kind of believe this, I think it's kind of an invalid theory, and really the reason why is because, like right now, in terms of the modern age and kind of how we've advanced as a species, I think it's like this, this kind of physiological and safety starts to kind of blend in the background. So I think it really requires a, a complete reweighting of how we think about human needs to really understand how consumer startups, you know, are actually like solving a problem that, that we have. Um, and so blow it up, don't want it anymore. Um, let's get beyond Maslow. 
And so this guy right here, uh, you know, he's, he, he has my heart. His name is Manfred Max Neef, and he is a Chilean economist of German descent. And no, I'm not going to try and go through an econ class and talk to you about uh, Manfred Max Neef in depth. I'm just going to kind of gloss over it. But why is he important to me? So basically, when I read this in college, I thought this was super interesting, and I kind of put it in the back of my mind. But what he did was he created a new framework of thinking about human needs. And he did it off observations of Latin American society. So he's Chilean. He's like trying to figure out like what actually drives people. Um, and you know, like again, like they're, again, they're not thinking about um, you know avoiding jungle cats and, anymore. Like again, it's an advanced society there. Uh, what actually are the needs? How can we solve these problems? How can public policy do that? So that's where he came from. But we're going to use it for consumer internet startups. So basically, what he did right here, no, it's not, it's, it's my, my other hero, right? Uh, basically, what he believed is that it wasn't a hierarchy. It wasn't like, I need to avoid Jungle Cat, and then I can do the startup. It's basically saying that we just need to check off some boxes here, right? So basically, we have all these different kind of needs that human beings have. Uh, and, th and that is kind of where we where we start off. And and yeah, you, there's some things that you don't have. There's some things that you don't get. It's a more nuanced view of the world, saying that like we need to check off as much of these boxes as we can. Um, but if not all of them are checked, it's okay. I can still lead lead a life. With Maslow's self actualization, it's supposed to be unobtainable. You can't get self actualization. So it kind of even limits the the the, the value of that model. So basically, you think about it. So there's ten things up here. I'll admit, I added authenticity, and I'll, I'll go into it why there. But otherwise, there's nine of these things, and only two of them actually relate to physicalness, protection and subsistence. So let me group them a little bit easier to understand. I definitely don't want to go line, line item on, on what each one of these means. Again, I believe that we can go to YouTube uh, and, and, and learn a lot of this. But right now, so our physical needs is like protect, protection, subsistence. Got it. Avoid jungle cat. Um, but the post-physical needs, right, um, they, I break them apart into kind of individual and social needs, right? So we are hardwired to be social, uh, social creatures, and we are hardwired to be individual at, uh, simultaneously. And so these are two groupings that we need to have in order to function. So the individual needs, um, actually, let's go social needs is like affection, understanding, participating, leisure. Uh, individual needs, creation, identity, freedom. And my favorite, the one I put in there, authenticity. Now let's go in a little bit and kind of how this actually works. Like cool, cool model, like how does it even matter? So physical needs, let's say what, what you are when you are protected, you know, you have care, you're safe, or when you have subsistence, you have physical health is perpetuated. What does Dub Smash do for that? Absolutely, absolutely nothing. We do nothing for this at all. Um, we do not do anything with physical needs. If you look at kind of like the social needs, Clearly doesn't do well with physical needs. Got it. Thank you, past John self, for writing this. All right, social needs, um, affection, humor, like humor, like Dub Smash. Of course, I think, I think that works. Dub Smash totally does kind of with the hum humor, understanding. Do we have critical p capacity, intuition? Uh, you know, like I really don't know. I don't think we actually solved that yet. Um, participation, reciprocity, dedication to something over time. Uh, I still don't know if we do that well yet. Uh, we're not good at the distribution. We're not good at the platform. Leisure, imagination, spontaneity. Okay, I think that Dub Smash definitely checks that box off. Now if we go, f so gray zone. So it's something, it's, it's a huge fact. We've struggled, you know, to be a social platform, right? So we're a creation platform right now. As a social platform, we've struggled, and that's where we've leveraged external partners on that one. Now let's look at this. Individual needs, uh, what, what does Dub Smash do with it? So creation, imagination, curiosity, identity, belonging, self-esteem, freedom, you know, this kind of autonomy and passion. If you see our content on there, uh, we're very irreverent. Uh, and authenticity, uh, which for me is making sure that you are expressing what you believe to be your real self, and that real self being comprised of your experiences and identities of, that you've had over time. What does Dub Smash do? In my opinion, Dub Smash hits the ball out of the park on a lot of these. Uh, going in there and making sure that we, we, ch we really scratch this itch that human beings hardwired intrinsically have you know, to go in and create and be something and express. And so that to me is, is the key distinction right here is that we do actually solve problems in this model. 
Uh, and so with Max Neef, like we do like very much so solve problems on an individual level. We are struggling and we uh, intend to solve more problems on the social level. Physical, we can live without that. So, or we can't live without that, but it's something that somebody else can solve. So, so all right, this is a cool framework. I geeked out a little bit. I admit, I geeked out a little bit. And so kind of like, how does this actually apply to Dub Smash? Like, what, what do we even do with this? Do we just sit there and do a philosophical cir circle jerk at night? No, I think that we actually applied it to our business and to heart. So, so basically, let's look at Dub Smash and let's look at how kind of our kind of content model operates right now. So we have two components, right? So we have a piece of sound content uh, as represented by the wave. And then we have that video, the one that uh, generated 12 million downloads by Neymar. It took him like, obviously, 10 seconds to create it. So um, basically, in our old model that we thought, we always thought, say it with video, it's the video, right? Like, we're creating videos. This is kind of our, our channel. Uh, the, the sound is simply uh, secondary to that. And the thing is that we actually codified this into our product thinking and our strategy. We're like, sound is secondary, so what do we not do? We didn't invest in our, uh, tagging our content. We didn't invest in, in a relevance engine. In fact, we had a content operations team that's just sitting there doing rote work, you know, just trying to uh, crush out you know, a couple editorial uh, things. We treated everything as a filter. And when you treat everything as a filter now, we're obviously trying to just expand the number of filters that we have in different formats. And so uh, we even called it internally, uh, all as design filter, you know, let's treat everything as a filter, including, you know, the sounds. And what that led to is we were building this roadmap and incrementally trying to uh, widen out the format so we, you're able to draw on it, you're able to add emojis onto it, you're able to kind of like chat like in these groups. Uh, and we even actually have an unreleased feature of face masks that we were playing around uh, with face masks and, uh, you know, we were on that train for a little bit as well. Um, that was the strategy that naturally comes out if you believe the video is the reason why people come to the application. And so, but thinking about it again, like when we kind of revisited and we realized that some of the stuff wasn't working, uh, what we did was is we, like, what we did was we just realized that mobile video has been around for years. Like we're not, we didn't invent mobile video. I mean, how could, how could our guy build it in an afternoon, you know, like, Basically, what he did was he plugged in a bunch of libraries and just let it let it rip. And so there's something amiss right here. It wasn't the video. In fact, it was the sound. And that's kind of like, it seems simple right now. It's this hindsight thing. But it was kind of a revolutionary thing in the way that we thought about our business. It was the sound that was actually solving a lot of these needs, according to Max Neve. Like, it's the sound because you choose Taylor Swift versus choosing, you know, this kind of, you know, Persian, you know, Farsi kind of, you know, folk dance. Like, it's that, that type of uh, individual choice that you have, that self-expression, uh, which fulfills the need, not simply creating a video, which you can do on your, your, uh, your um, iPhone already for years at that point. And so that was the key thing, uh, that it's the sound that makes Dub Smash, right? It's not the video. The video is an important part of it. The video is how we get distribution, but in the end, it's the sound. That, that, that is kind of the big revelation that we have. And so what does that actually do? Ooh, I love Rage Face Comics. They help make every presentation better. So, um, so yeah, so on the left, we focused on kind of the format expansion. And on the right, you know, we are focusing on building this private network, Dub Talk. Again, observed behavior that we saw, people were sending WhatsApp dubs, you know, people were sending iMessage dubs, but you know, that uh, that is the wrong th way to think about it. Uh, users didn't adopt these features at all. You know, they weren't dub smash. We were only able converting five percent of our, our our broad users like into using these features. So therefore, we never got the network effects on it. We weren't able to generate the retention off of that. And so again, citing Max Neve, this wasn't solving a problem that wasn't solved by another platform. So here's the other kind of revelation thinking about it is that uh, Dub Smash in the end is a content company. It's not a communication platform. It, in fact, distribution isn't the problem that we've solved nor have we solved well at all. Uh, people come to Dub Smash for the content. That is why they're here. Uh, and so once we kind of realize that, then that helps us rethink our business, it rethinks our strategy, it rethinks our organization, it rethinks our product roadmap. Um, and so if you think about it now, that 
content team that we've ignored out there, that the tagging of our content, the discoverability, the personalization, all this stuff was that was once ignored is now the focus. Now we go in there and we say, okay, we need to tag this content. We need to build you know, discoverability tools. We need to get this uh, content out onto the internet and actually generate metadata and SEO back into the application. It's a radically different um, uh, strategy for a company and it's all because we just flipped something, just a small tiny thing. Uh, and, and it's kind of amazing that uh, we didn't uh, do it earlier. You have to invest the time uh, to think about your business the right way. And so this is what we did beforehand. These are those 100,000 daily installs. It all because we have this, this content on the platform right there and it just drives all this stuff into Dub Smash and then we've always shut the spigot off and we put a little bit in their back so we get the content on the platform. It's the wrong way to think about our business because in the end, like, it, we're just slowly dying on that part. But actually the way we're building our business right now is that what we need to do is we need to get our content as far uh, and wide as possible because when we put content on other people's platform, it reciprocates and drives people back into the application. And so already in kind of our first incarnation and our first test in that, we're already getting significantly higher retention than we ever did with our highly retaining communication platform, which did retain people if you used it highly, but we didn't get enough people into it. So it's counterintuitive, actually. So, so okay, takeaways. I've been kind of up here and geeking out a little bit in my experiment. So uh, the first takeaway is really, really, really invest the time to think about what problem your startup is solving, especially if you are in consumer internet. Cannot emphasize that enough. I think um, I hope it's a huge part of the curriculum here at the family. You, this is this is this is table stakes. You need to understand what problem you're actually solving. And right now, in some cases, it's much easier to move in some ways to a very transactional, very material model, especially with e-commerce here in Berlin. But I think that I think that if you, she loves you. Um, I think that if you want to go into consumer and you have something in there, applying this framework here can can really kind of like help uh, rethink your model and really be able to build the right features and take the right strategy for your company. So I think that may be the second one. Okay, second one, human needs are more than physical. Uh, so again, this model that I introduced right there, it's just a model. They say uh, not all, I think there's this uh, classic uh, consultant phrase that um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, so it's not, it's not dogmatic, right? Like it's something there that like, uh, take it take it for what it's worth. Maybe it isn't Max Neef. Maybe it's something else that, that speaks to you. But, but go out there to research. People have thought about these problems, and you can apply them to your business. And then finally, I like this guy. He's, he's pretty cool. I want to hang out and grab some Chilean beer with him or something. Uh, actually, he's German, so like you can have German beer. Uh, so he's a cool guy. I, like, like his, his uh, book is uh, pretty dry. Um, and it probably isn't relevant, so, um, but, but just think about it, extrapolate on it, you know, make it your own. So uh, I, I definitely would uh, have you check them out. So, um, so that is kind of towards the tail end of my, my, my talk. Um, I would go on, uh, I have a lot to say and I have a lot more to say on how to apply philosophy to your startups. And so uh, next talk, uh, if I'm privileged to do one, I will try and uh, combine Euclid, Kant, Elon Musk, and Peter, angry Peter Thiel, uh, because they talk about first principles and postulates, uh, which is a fantastic way to rethink, um, uh, instead of asking what problem to solve, uh, this one here is how to solve it. Uh, so thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the time. Uh, please uh, raise your hand if you were somewhat inspired by this talk. Woo, awesome. <sighs> thank you. What's your counterattack strategy uh, when, like, Facebook decided to, okay, um, Dove Smash is a very cool app. We're getting, like, you know, so many inbound and outbound tra uh, traffic uh, to and from Dove Smash. So let's see what we can learn from them and what sort of features uh, we could drive and, like, implement it on Messenger. So Oh yeah, I mean, listen, I have a lot to say about Messenger. It's uh, you know good on them. They were able They're to really drive. good at you know copy and paste. You know they just copy and paste the Snapchat. So. I mean, what what's interesting about like um, I send Messenger stuff all the time. Like, what are these guys doing? Like, and we've actually had a lot of people talk with Messenger as well. And like they they actually when you talk to them, so we we have insights from their their team talking about um, 
their feature development, they really don't understand kind of like the market that they're in. Like while they have like a lot of resources and, and clearly uh, they have the network uh, effect on there, uh, for some of these smaller kind of niche ways, like and, and dub smash is niche, right? Like um, to, to to create stuff, uh, they still don't get it. They've they've tried to hire uh, a bunch of us, you know, because they want to solve apply some of this this thinking here. And so I think that we've actually advanced um, a lot of our thinking about how interaction frameworks and and ways to actually um, really like take messaging to the next level. We'd love to apply them to the next dub smash, but we tried it and we didn't. Uh, we had our shot, and uh, we we need to deliver value back to our shareholders, so we can't can't try it again. But but yeah, right now I I think that the the copy paste strategy um, it it works in specific cases. I think Instagram, for example, um, it's working right because you just have the network right there, and then there was that missing thing, that rawness of people's feeds. So adding the the stories feature there like makes total sense. And like I I I. I, I've been moving more towards it. I, I still try and maintain both, but but I, I, it's just so much effort to do that, and I've been moving more towards Instagram. And I think I think I've seen that um, tangibly with a lot of my friends since uh, that's happened as well. So it's a fantastic strategy uh, that Facebook's portfolio is doing to bleed Instagram, uh, Snapchat, on a bunch of different fronts. And so Snapchat now is looking at international expansion. They're looking at getting into lip syncing. You know, so it's it's actually going to be very interesting uh, what they do in that space. So I think for us right now, we've at times have chased competitors. We've chased Messenger. We've chased WhatsApp. We've chased Snapchat. And uh, what we found out that chasing people just doesn't work. Like it's it's called like strategic straddling. So like you you bolt something on, and it wasn't meant for that purpose. And and all of a sudden it just doesn't work. You know, like and you're like, why doesn't it work? And you you have to you have to really understand again what your business is. So. So we're focused on just building a great business. Uh, we're focusing on embracing how Dub Smash users use the application, uh, and we think just by by focusing on the user, thinking the strengths, and, but considering at least uh, people's perceptions on on how Dub Smash fits in their, you know, in their 168 hour week and their uh, 120 uh, apps they have on their phone, we need to make sure that we we deliver something cool for them. So. Yeah, so fun. Um, so. Uh, y your talk was really amazing. It's sort of like you know, walk you walked us through the journey of like you know, how you evolved the product. So, um, as I understood, correct and correct me if I'm wrong, that first the focus was on the um, social aspect of the app, where we want to, uh, you know, um, promote collaboration. Yeah. And that was not the focus, and you guys moved on discoverability of the content and tagging and so on. So I'm um, I'm wondering that would will you ever you know will you go back to the the collaboration aspect of the app at some point in future as well, or is uh, so if you could talk. A yeah, bit. I mean like like I mean the thing was like the social graph. I think is the most important <laughs> distinction that we're in our strategy that we've changed and. Uh, I think what we've realized is that um, content isn't just an accessory. Content is what we do, um, and people can build networks around content. You see it actually all the time. You know, like a Tumblr, for example, it's built around people's uh, uh, repost. Um, you know, uh, uh, Quora is uh, a network built around um, the content of, of questions. Uh, there's all these different uh, ways to do it, and, and for us, we were trying to build content. Or we were trying to build a network um, directly connecting with friends and then sending dubs to them, right? It's a narrow format for something that already has quite a bit of, I mean, the messaging space is pretty saturated right there. So so like it, it was something that was, in fact, looking back on it now, was doomed from the start, uh, where you can't like, like why do I send you know dubs when I have all these other platforms there? And so <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it, that, that's I think what we've, what we've learned is that like we're building a network around the content now instead of people. Um, and then we build interactions around that network uh, right there. So, so it's, it's a bit of a framework, like we're very early in our, in our execution on it, but, but we're, we put a lot of thought into it and we, we've obviously tried a bunch of things that didn't work out. And so we believe that this is uh, the right path for us. Yeah. We'll go. Thanks. Um, I'm curious what in at Dub Smash when you're trying to figure out what problem you're solving, what channels you use to inform that. Are you looking at the data? Are you talking to customers? Can you talk tell us a little bit about that? It's it's always been a struggle at Dub Smash. There's been like kind of a, a philosophical battle that's been fought. 
uh, how much do we talk to our users versus how much do we look at our, our user behavior at scale? And so right now, I think uh, the, what has kind of won out is looking at our user behavior at scale by data analysis. Um, and so there's been many, many initiatives. I've started a, a bunch, like half a dozen on my own to bring like users in to go in and uh, tell people how to use the application and stuff. Uh, if you, anybody here wants to start a like uh, affordable uh, user, like scrappy user testing startup uh, in Berlin, uh, I, I will I will throw my network at that and try and get that funded because uh, there's a huge uh, need for that. So yeah, it's either been like expensive, like I'm going to pay 10,000 euros to have like 10 people use the application. It's kind of like it's a little bit of exaggeration, but but that's kind of like the vendors that we had in there. And then when we try bringing like school kids to come use it, then it's like people are like, well, we don't know if you're going to like um, kidnap our children, like so you know you have to go to the schools to do that. And then the German kind of like high school market, which is totally our, our um, just high schoolers in, in general are kind of like who uses the platform. It's been a huge struggle for us to, to bring people in there who haven't experienced Dub Smash, you know, that, that already have a preconceived notion about it. And the, the features that they, we would delineate out of that are actually very, very um, uh, vanilla, vanilla, like uh, in terms of like, we kind of already know that that's the feature set that they want. And so kind of the strategy that we've always been that girl. Uh, pursuing is, is really like data analysis at large, but supplementing that with qualitative data. Let me give you an example. Um, so one, when we were building our social graph, we were, you know, we're like super, super scrappy star. We're like, we're gonna, we're gonna upload your address book and then we're gonna auto friend you with everyone in your address book. And so we're like, we're gonna do this. And we're like, we're looking at the numbers and we're seeing this massive growth. We're like, yes, you know, all these address books. I think we got like 40 million address books. You know, they, they upload a hash, you know, to the server. And then when you upload your address book on Dub Smash, it matches those hashes. And then it gives you like, you know, Dub Smash friends. And we're like, this is super cool. We got a bunch of connections. Uh, the problem was like, we never got any user feedback on how that actually felt for people. So like w when we finally did, we were like, why is this graph not working? Why is it not sticky? Why is the retention not good? And what we did is we looked at it and we were like, it's creepy as hell. Like it's creepy as hell when you when you auto friend people uh, instead of suggesting them. Uh, there's you you take away agency of people friending somebody say I want to be your friend on Dub Smash. So we just do it. They the other people didn't even get push notifications. And then all of a sudden they're like, Why am I friends on Dub Smash with my ex girlfriend? <laughs> she wants to eat the deer. Uh, why am I friends on Dub Smash with my ex girlfriend? You know why am I friends on Dub Smash with you know like. Why, why am I friends in uh, Dub Smash with like, you know, like my, 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 my father-in-law, you know, like, so it, it was super creepy. And, and that was something that, frankly, I just take that as a lesson. We should have much earlier qualitatively validated the features. So like, I think it's on one part, let's make sure that it's, it's rooted in some sort of strong analysis, strong hypothesis, but every single feature that goes out there needs to at least have a quick wash of, of, of qualitative feedback. So, so whether it's, it's just, just a, a couple people or friends or family, uh, family to be able to do that, uh, having and really grilling them about it um, is, is the way to go. So that's been kind of at least the, 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 the way that we've kind of settled in terms of, of handling kind of user feedback. But, but yeah, it's something that we've always struggled with, so. Cool, thank you. Uh, we're gonna take the last one, actually, because we have another talk after that. <laughs> Hello, thanks for the talk. I wonder at what time of your product journey did you talk to the um, music license owners the first time? Because they seem like a very big part of your product. And uh, did you hack the rights at first place or when did you talk to them? Uh, so uh, that is something I typically stay away from from the product side, but, uh, but it is a good question and it is very valid to the business. Um, so actually, uh, we didn't talk to them early enough. And so actually, uh, when I got hired and uh, I, I was hired at the same time as our now president of, of Dub Smash there, and basically it was just like, man, we should have talked to them uh, a lot earlier because they were ready to pull the trigger on us. And so, so but, um, but thankfully that has been resolved. There are some uh, progress on there. I can't comment too much on, on what's happening there, but at least uh, there is 
progress and there is um, a, a solution where the music industry and Dust Mash can coexist. Now, simultaneously, uh, we have seen, uh, we've observed uh, people who have put music on the platform. I can't really tell, like, like unless it's obviously like a SoundCloud or Spotify that needs these deals to have um, uh, artists on their platform. You can't actually point to another platform where having the music deals on there is actually successful for them. Um, and so, like, Flippagram, for example, uh, have a music deal, and then they, it didn't do anything for them, right? Like, it, it actually, uh, their platform died shortly after they signed those deals. Uh, I believe Vine also explored that as well on Twitter. Uh, and it's a lot of the reasons, actually, why when you go and you try and fundraise, when you have a music component on there, you actually have a lot of VCs say, I don't want to deal with the music industry again. I've been burned on it. So it is always a risk to the business. Uh, it is something, a risk that we have mitigated. Um, and so we are moving, I believe, uh, much further away from music because music naturally isn't what Dub Smash uh, was meant for. It was built off of kind of quotable internet, like making absurd quotes that you've, Ozzy Tony was actually kind of the big driver of uh, early Dub Smash's growth. And so, so that, that's kind of like the type of content that we believe is, is natural at, at Dub Smash. So we focused our partnership efforts to really expanding that back catalog. So. All right, again, john at dubsmash.com. If you have any questions, I will do that. So.